when Mendel was a kid. Okay, Darwin was born in, at, no, about, he was born in 09, so Darwin is older than Gregor Mendel. Okay, by about, what, 13 years. So when Darwin, when uh, Darwin was in his 20s, which was, eight, you know, 1830, so he probably went 1830, uh, about 25, so 1833, okay, Mendel was only probably 10 or 11 years old. So Darwin was on his voyage when Mendel was a kid. And that's where he discovered and started doing his theory of natural selection. So he hadn't done his pea plant experiments yet. So the idea of a gene, right, this inherited thing, was unknown to Darwin. And we didn't even know exactly what a gene was because we didn't even learn about DNA and its structure until 1952. This, right, or last century, sorry. This last century. So it's important, and I'm glad you brought that up because Mendel um, and his understandings come to play in the fourth and last principle of Darwin. So, but Darwin noticed that there was variation. Who else went on a voyage and noticed that things varied? Oh, um, Ooh. The, the nice beard, right, from the video? Alfred Wallace. Younger than Darwin. Darwin was married. He came back when he was young. He didn't want to write his book because he married his first cousin and she was super religious. Elizabeth was like, Darwin, honey, if you write your book where you talk about how life came from natural progress and that God didn't put it the way it is here, you're going to burn in the depths of hell and I'm going to be alone in heaven. And I love you, sweetheart, so please don't write that book and come and hang out with me in heaven. And he had ten kids, and one of his kids, Anna, died at the age of, I think, ten. She was one of his favorite kids, because we all have our favorites. She used to hang out with him a lot and, uh, when he was doing a lot of his experiments. He came home and he did tons of experiments. He, he, he contributed a lot to science, not just with evolution. And when she died, you know, he, you know, he went into a depression. He was sick for a lot of the, uh, a portion of his life, and he never wrote his book. And it wasn't until Wallace came, and he put his forth, his explanation of this, that Darwin was like, oh, crap, my original idea is going to get stolen by this kid, right? And so they presented their ideas together, and everybody pretty much gave Darwin the credit of, of coming up with it first. And, and, right, and that's why, Dar uh, why Wallace, when he finally published his full book, he actually titled it Darwinism, giving Darwin the nod. The second component is that organisms tend to produce too many babies. They produce too many. I mean, uh, there's a certain species of salmon that produces 16,000 eggs. Imagine if all those eggs got fertilized and turned into adult salmon. It would take like 10 generations for the entire oceans to be filled with salmon. So what this does is when we create too many offspring, we generate this competition for limited resources. Humans haven't quite gotten there yet, but we're getting there. We see that in certain populations. Darwin actually read a article from a guy by the name of Thomas Malthus, who was, which, which he wrote this article much before Darwin's uh, discoveries, where he talked about in London, when the population of um, people, humans, in London gets too, really high, everybody's crowded, you see these spikes, uh, this spike in disease and poverty and death rates, primarily of those who are the most impoverished. So the people who have all the resources, right, you know, they're doing okay, but when you see this huge population increase, you see this struggle to survive. You see it in humans. So Darwin was like, man, if that happens in London, then you know that's happening out in the wild with organisms that produce way too many offspring. So we've established now that A, there's variation, and B, everybody's struggling to survive, fighting for those resources. Competition for food, competition for shelter, competition against predators, and competition for mates. Right? They're all competing, yeah. Race? Or what do you mean by race? Oh, you mean we'll all have similar phenotypes? I mean, are you talking specifically just skin color? No, like in general, like we'll all start to look kind of similar. That already happened. That's already happened. It's already happening. Yeah, it's already happening. Yeah, it's already happening. It's already happening. It's already happening. You should read this article. Like instead of like we all look a lot more similar. Okay, there was this issue that came out here, the new face of America. That's kind of what's happening, right? When you have this mixing pot, right? So if you take all the different types of predominantly, like, you know, if you look at the different populations that have been isolated over the course of human evolution, because humans have evolved, if you want to study just human evolution, we have isolated ourselves for thousands of years. When you get a population and you isolate it and separate it from other populations, all the random mutations that occur in that population are going to be shared from that population, not this population. 
And so any trait that is unique to that population is going to be shared by only those members. Whether it's darker skin or different shaped eyes or whatever it is of different shaped nose, those members are going to have it. These guys that evolved in a different place, they have other random genetic mutations okay, that may or may not favor their population. So that's why those traits are unique to those guys. Now as we start to bring these populations together, right, we start to see this blending effect. right? This actually increases genetic diversity when you mix genes. It doesn't decrease it. It increases it. So if I take these guys over here that all look one way, and these guys over here, and we start shuffling the deck, we start to create much greater genetic diversity, not less genetic diversity. Okay? And so what happens is you see here, this is kind of what a computer rendition, there was a computer program where they put like, I don't know, a couple hundred people or whatever into a computer format, and they said, okay, what would this person look like? So if you take all the different types of races that you would find here in America, and we define race differently in America as race is defined in Europe, as race is defined in Africa, as race is defined in other countries. Race is a sociology term, it's not a scientific term, it's not a biological term, right? Uh, race is relative to depending on uh, where you are and what your culture and how your culture defines, or how your society defines race. Uh, but this is the time article that I would probably recommend you, you looking at. Yeah, ethnicity. These are social terms, right? Uh, in biology, we only look at things like, you know, we would use things like species, right? Or, you know, breeds, things like that. A genus, a family, a order, a phyla. That's how we use taxonomy to, to classify things. We don't classify things in terms of race. If you go to Europe, they don't look at black, white, they look at French, Spanish, right? You could be, I mean, you could have dark skin, you could, you know, you could be black, but you're French. So they don't call you black, they don't call you white, they call you French, you're French. That's but it's, that's not the way it is here in America, right? It's a little bit So race is uh, more of a, you, you learn that in sociology. Okay, I'm oh, sorry, this last one. So as we have this struggle for survival, the different variations create adaptations, and some are gonna have an edge and some are not, okay? And that could be from the way that they look or the way that they behave. From the frequency of their bird song may attract more mates as long as it's something that's controlled by their genes. Because if it's something that they acquire, right, if they learn a song, it's not something they can pass on. So the adaptations must be something that they can pass on in order for it to shape the way the population is gonna look over time. Lamarck, Jean-Baptiste Lamarck said, oh, these things start to change the way they look over the course of their life, and then they have babies and their babies look like them. Like the stretching of a giraffe's neck, or the increased size of a fiddler crab's claw. And we know now that you cannot pass on acquired traits any more than I can pass on a tattoo that I got in my 20s to my offspring, right? <laughs> Darwin knew that the only traits that you can pass on are ones that are inherited. You are born with them, but he didn't know how. And so you bring up a good point. Did Darwin understand this last component of natural selection? No, he didn't even fully understand how we pass on traits. Go ahead, go. Okay, he didn't understand until Mendel and uh, Francis and Crick. So guys, this is the pepper moth experiment that you just did a survey on. We understand that, you know, which moth is going to be easily seen by the, uh, the bird, the black one, and the white one. I expect you guys to do the um, web quest and the, the link to the simulation. You guys need to do that on your own at home or here on campus, okay? And answer all the questions in the web quest. It explains this example perfectly. Okay. On your lab that you just did, one of the questions is, what is fitness? Fitness is very simple. It's the ability, you know, it's the ability for certain members to uh, have a higher, or uh, have a higher ability to survive and be able to produce. The key is reproduce. Because just because I have, uh, I'm stronger and faster, and it makes me live longer, if it doesn't mean that I'm going to have more kids then the population is not going to start looking more and more like me. Okay, those organisms must have a higher reproductive fitness in order to uh, change the entire species population. Okay, so this slide is explained like this. Okay, so right here, I wrote that the moths that were, the moths that were dark were controlled by a dominant. You said they were controlled by a dominant you know, uh, allele and the light ones were recessive. Hey guys, is that a genotype or phenotype? Genotype. 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 Yeah, what's the phenotype gonna be? Dark. Dark. Yeah, you guys got it. Is that a genotype or a phenotype? Genotype. 
It, what is the phenotype going to be? <sighs> phenotype, what's the phenotype? <laughs> the birds that are part of nature, natural selection. It's yellow, right? Yellow crab. Exactly. Yellow. We went over this like two minutes ago. <laughs> Can I finish this one? Yeah. Nice. Talk about red and yellow crabs later. <laughs> now, listen. Do you think nature cares whether it's big A, big A, or big A, little A? No. What's the only thing that matters? If it's dark or light. If it's dark or if it's light. Nature doesn't look to see if you're homozygous or heterozygous. It doesn't care. All that matters is that you're dark or light. Phenotype is the only thing that matters when it comes to natural selection. Not genotype. Nature doesn't care what's inside your DNA. It just cares what you look like. And that's what gives you the edge. It's those things that give you the edge that are in your DNA that you can pass on that is going to shape that population from generation to generation. Okay, I'm going to stop here. Yeah, because I'm tired of lecture. And here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you the remaining period. Hold on one second. Remaining period, there's laptops next door that you can grab. If you have an iPad or an iPhone, and I will walk around and make sure that you're doing this, you have a Principles of Evolution quiz. Okay? Oh, this is Evan. Actually, let me go over about three more slides, and then you guys can, can do this quiz. Did you guys read about this already? Actually, I'll just take, I'll give you the rest of the period to do the quiz. We'll, we'll talk about this next class. Uh, but if you guys need a laptop in Miss Banky's classroom, Okay, come follow me now and come get, actually just go next door, grab a laptop and bring it back. Who? Gerard. Yeah. Gerard. Two ladies are asking for you. Oh, Gerard! Oh, 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 are you guys going to cut his hair? Yes. Yeah. 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 Don't let him cut your hair. Okay. Come in, there's a You got, who wants laptop? Let's go this way. It's a laptop. So follow me this way. Follow me this way.
Just a minute, can I go to the bathroom? Yeah, I'm gonna go too. <laughs> So that's going to be in there. It's the one that we had to translate, transcribe the DNA sequence to figure out which genes that you will take for your pad and you're going to draw it. And yet, yet, uh, the worksheet is back there. There's also a screen test of the exposure. Thank you. 